Gareth and I've been trying to work out what I do with my lived experience of the criminal justice system. Uh, since before my release in 2017, I've been studying criminology. Before this, I was studied by criminology, I guess. I sort of, people were interested in the sort of sentence I was serving. Uh, so um, I started figuring out like how I got to where I had, and uh, I sort of done this alongside how I was studying, and that's sort of how I got to where I am today. Uh, like everyone's been like really open and personal today, so I'm just going to sort of give you a bit of a background to the people that don't know me. Uh, but I also don't want to go too much into it because it's a network about sort of uh, promoting change and stuff, and not getting hung up on on where I am specifically, but just what I can do with what with where I am is is one of the values that sort of appeals to me most about this network. So um, I guess me and my family were faced with quite a few different adversities when I was young. And then I find myself bumping into all sorts of other adversities in the years after. Uh, and it took me a long time to realise that I was often sort of more responsible for ending up in those situations than I realised at the time. But I think as uh, Mark said uh, earlier, sort of growing up in a Thatcher government or whatever, like, uh, I don't know, like I didn't grow up in a Thatcher government, I'm not quite that old, but um, I, it just keeps happening like you know people find themselves in situations where it's harder to be the right sort of person and it's not that we it, it, it can't be done like people who grew up next to me in the same sorts of situations didn't take the the, the past that i did um didn't hurt people in the way that i did but they they're the exceptions they're they're, they're the ones they have to be part of this conversation as well but like you know um it took me a long time to get to this point now where i can explain uh, who I am and what I think would have made it easier for me to do the right thing earlier on, I think. Uh, I say writing it down, I just like rumbled off my script, don't I? So uh, I guess I owe wh where I am now um, to being able to find the language and find the people who would hear me out. Uh, but it was definitely a specific sort of language I had to learn to start asking for the right sorts of help because uh, when I started sort of forward into meetings with youth offending workers and psychiatrists and uh, support workers and things like that um i find very quickly that like i couldn't explain what i meant to these people because uh there were all sorts of assumptions that sort of came with the things that i said or like even before i'd opened my mouth there were a set of assumptions already there and so it felt frustrating that i sort of had these things that i wanted to say but i didn't uh, it was only sort of out of luck in prison, sort of finding my way into a, a, an advanced course, a degree course, uh, quite far into a long time in prison, um, that I managed to start learning how to speak to people and say, this is what I need. And, you know, I get what you're saying when you say I'm this sort of risk, but I think it's more like this. And uh, it's still a battle now, like, you know, four years on after being released, you know, I, I still struggle to explain the support that I need to people. And uh I, I think what i want to do most is to help everyone talk to each other so i kind of like have got used to using this language and i can see where we might refer to one thing and think we're speaking about the same thing but we're coming at it from such a different angle that an academic and a person with lived experience just aren't on the same page and, and uh, i think that's the skill that i've been sort of learning and developing over the last four years so I've done a few different things since my release. As I say, I finished my degree. Um, I worked with Learning Together, an uh, uh, initiative from Cambridge University that brings higher education to prisons. Uh, they helped me out and I sort of, uh, I think I've sort of done my best to try and sort of help them back as well. Uh, I've helped tweak um, prison officer training with the Unlock graduates and I spent some time working with policy workers at a Police and Crime Commissioner's office as well. Um, it's a pleasure today to be among New Leaf, I'm definitely reading off the script now, it's a pleasure to be with my New Leaf colleagues today, explaining to what to you what it is that we stand for, what we plan to do and what makes us qualified to say how we do it. It's quite a bold statement, huh? Uh, but for this, 
for me, this network became appealing because its members measured their effectiveness on the outcomes it has for people still within the criminal justice system and not on measures that seem to satisfy contracts. It, you know, we, we've got a different sort of theme to, to how we're going about our work, I think. Uh, we aim to do this not by demanding uh, like the fame or the image that sort of goes with sort of, you know, helping other people or lost causes or whatever, you know, because uh, when we're not we're not giving something to someone that someone always added, hasn't already given to us in some way. Uh, we're trying to not align ourselves with one particular sort of fashion of criminology over another, but we're just like looking at what works and noticing when things don't feel right. Um, the network as a whole has learned some of the language in which those in power use to describe and accommodate criminal justice, and it is engaged fully. We have all learned the language of contracts and bids and rate cards and things like that. Um, and, and as an independent lived experience consultant, I, like many of my friends in this network, have learned to tap into my real life traumas, memories and triggers. We go to conferences run by CGS charities and academic departments of various universities uh, to speak to particular experiences we've had. Uh, we reflect on the agents involved in our experiences and we attempt to take stock of, their, stock of their complexities, all whilst sort of being real and being attached to the emotions that that sort of thing uh, obviously triggers. Um, I say it's been a strange few years to recall, but I essentially went from being a life sentence prisoner, a cause I was certain to be lost, to an academic, a guy who works with the MOJ and the PCC, uh, from, an, from a renegade, I, I was angry and violent, uh, to a person who campaigns for better access to education. It feels incredible, and I mean that like in the literal sense. It feels like quite sort of existentially unbelievable sometimes. Uh, and I've done that, I think, by understanding how my lived experience had interacted with the political and penal decisions by learning of the platforms in which I could share those things. Uh, but the platforms have existed until very recently have been particularly concerning. They often require a person with lived experience to learn another language um, of the delegates and the conferences and find a way of translating their stories for five minute presentations. These stories often simply just get recorded in a service user interview or they'll be on a website in a little quote that sort of, you know, captures something profound and has an essence, but uh, over the years that I've been sort of helping out, it seems to be a really slow process to sort of trick and down and actually helping people that are still in prison, still struggling to find the language that they need to speak about. Uh, so I think quite frequently to uh, the first academic conference I went to, it was quite an a, a awakening experience. Uh, I went to this really strange building in Cambridge University, owned by St John's College. Uh, I say it's a strange building. I I I, I travelled there from a decap prison that morning, you know. So, and they're quite weird places, as some of you might know already. Uh, but this place was particularly strange, panelling and all decorative stuff inside, and a lot of people uh, drinking really good coffee, eating great sandwiches. I remember that. Um, talking about the problems with criminal justice, talking about why it's hard to access education, why it's hard to engage people in their own rehabilitation. Uh, I, I felt privileged to be there. It felt like a grand and good thing to be a part of. Uh, in one of the afternoon sessions, I'd raised my hands quite precociously, you know, my first time in an academic setting like this. Uh, and I asked a barbed question to the face of the National Offender Management Service, which is now HMPPS. Uh, one and the only uh, a woman I grew to have great respect for, a woman called Ruth Mann. Um, we had like a lot of conversations quite sort of fleetingly over the last few years, but um, you know, uh, she she was definitely sort of present when I started thinking that I, I, I had a voice and something useful to say at these places. But she, her first interaction with me was me being sort of facetious, I don't know, sort of pedantic and sort of picking her up on a point of her presentation. I, I, I said I didn't understand why um, as, as an organisation that was charged with sort of reducing offending and reducing the harm caused by, by crime, would actively choose to label us offenders when they're in their when we're in their care. Mm. 
a little bit of dry mouth. Uh, and I guess what many of you will be thinking right now is like a bit of a smart Alec question. Yeah, call me a fender. Uh, and it sort of gathered a bit of a, a sort of air in the room. People thought, you know, it sounded profound. And like, uh, I think at the time it sort of struck a chord with an atmosphere that was sort of spreading through the criminal justice sector. You know, I don't think I was the first person to point that out, is what I'm saying. But it, it really resonated with what people were saying in the room. And it sort of took off. Uh, since then, there's this idea, there's a, like a hermeneutic problem, okay? Fancy word from a Cambridge conference, I right? And it just means that, like, uh, we were sort of only just breached into this idea of access and lived experience. And because we were doing that, uh, there was a whole set of issues that didn't have any social language that went with it. We, we, we were learning how to speak about that in, within the framework that already existed. And we were in buildings that were quite obviously the authority on what criminal justice and crime uh, was. They, they were the people that decided what things meant. Uh, you know, I'm saying this point, sort of, you know, people, you know, there's some murmurs and some good questions and stuff, but if I'm to be perfectly honest, I think that sort of triggered uh, a sort of sideline of conference, a criminology conference that sort of got us distracted uh, from the point that I was trying to make at, the, at that conference. Uh, let me find my place because I've gone off from there. I feel like the movement has cost us a lot. Uh, in almost four years since I was a serving prisoner, I've taken part in lots of different boards and conferences. Uh, I've even gone to try and explain what desistance means on the London to prison officers. So again, precociously, I guess, turn up to um, this southern jail. Um, and I try to explain this word to system. Uh, I'm getting like a hissing sound. I don't know if that's me or... We can't hear anything, Gareth. Okay. Just me being distracted. Then. I'm not trying to get out of it. I'll finish, don't worry. Uh... <sighs> Sorry. Just turning it down a little bit. Um, it wouldn't be an online conference if there weren't tech issues. Let's be let's be uh, real. Uh, it's been flawless up until this bit. You know, uh, just got to style it out, Gareth. Style it out. If anyone can, uh, Gareth can. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, so I turned up to this uh, sort of meeting in this prison where they were talking about rehabilitative culture, um, and they wanted me to speak. And they wanted me to explain to prison officers. Uh, what the word desistance means and how they could sort of implement it in their daily jobs. Uh, it was quite a sort of strange experience anyway. I remember getting there and being struck by the fact that everyone was locked up in the middle of the day for this conference, but they were talking about sort of, you know, getting everyone to sort of take hold of their own rehabilitation. But I was there to explain what all that stuff meant, so it, it, it's all right. Uh, and I did. It was like really well sort of received. I sort of tried to say that, um, you know, desistance and the language that uh, I think it turned to HMPPS by then, um, was starting to use about like how, how a prison officer sort of enables someone to take responsibility for their action. Uh, so lots of positive comments from the, from the, from the audience. Uh, but then like, so anecdotally since then, uh, I still keep in contact with people that are in prison, my friends, you know, uh, are all sorts of different people now. And uh, like, we just, like Mike said earlier, you know, like learning from as many different people as you can is, is, is the best thing. And, and, uh, and I like to think that like, they also sort of remind me that I don't know the contemporary problems of being in prison as well when I speak to them. So they give me a lot when I, when, when I do manage to catch up with them. Uh, but, you know, some of them have said since, since this, like, move from HMPPS to sort of change the language and stuff, they can hear the prison officers reading off language like desistance and, uh, you know, and, like, uh, encouraging sort of peer support and stuff. But they're, they're doing it in a way that sort of, uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be changing the culture. It, it, it feels like... So, uh, um, 
it, it feels like they've taken the new labels that we've discussed and tried to figure out that would reduce the impact that the language they use has on us. And they've, they've just applied it to the same way they have about acting around their jobs, whether that was uh, positive or negative before. They've, they've just sort of aligned it with how they were dealing with their job before. And uh, it struck me that there must be something that we're not picking up on if it's just me turning up with my lived experience and expecting that to solve the problems of creating better practice in prison. Uh, and so it's, it seems important, it's, that seems to evidence to me that we create hierarchies of language, that uh, we place the importance over one set of language over another. And this seems to go through trends. We sometimes use, uh, if you can track the history of criminology and penal history, uh, we use religion and morality to explain to, um, crime. Other times, the language of mental health or psychological defects has been used. Or economic or sociological effects have been used to describe trends in crime. It will depend on who you ask and when as to why crime is as it is. But my point here is that we can only ever resolve the issue when we understand that all of these perspectives have their role to play. Uh, and my personal experience of prison is only ever going to be valuable if it's used to inform how we make it more helpful to our aims at reducing crime and rehabilitating those who cause harm. Uh, but I would be guilty of the same things that our justice departments have been for generations. If I were to make a claim that I understood the complexities in which that unhelpful language exists in the first place. Understanding why a prison officer uses the new prison service instructions on what to call feeding time uh, to objectify and separate them from their prisoners they work with is much more useful, is a much more useful confidence to have over one where we pick a new word to replace the last one we had. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is that it's, it's still true that we must consider the language that you, we're using and how it changed the relationships that we have with the people we work with or for or under. The point I made at that conference, at that first conference for me was uh, being called an offender really felt like I was being held in this constant identity. But it never truly explained why I was causing the harm I did. I was expected to correct an impression of the person I was rather than the person I was learning I knew I, 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 knew I was to be. Uh, so even in this speech, I've assumed the legitimacy of my anecdotes. I've presented my lived experience as a fact, because to me, it's all been factual. And it's really hard to not do that with a sense of authority, deserved or otherwise. If I were to start a story about my experiences around criminal justice and how I fell into the troubled institutions I've become so familiar with, it's really difficult for people to say, well, that's not right. Or that doesn't apply to the general criminal justice conflict. Uh, there's a Guardian article um, came out a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about the US elections where people were, I'm not going to go into it, it's, it's quite a long, it's, it's nice, um, but uh, they were talking about the problem with... Uh, just a little bit of time left now, Gareth, sorry, just oh. overrunning a bit, sorry mate. Uh, okay, so the general theme of the article was basically just like question what we've done with the term lived experience and just, you know, sort of take a sort of stock check and make sure we're not running away and creating another problem with the language that you, we're using. Uh, so this group, the New Leaf Network, is different from the convergence of CG, CGS organisations before. And for me, the reason it feels different is because we've emphasised the importance of the humility over hubris, action over image. And so I wanted to claim my allegiance by expressing the shortfalls of our own voice. How do we enhance the conversation and encourage it rather than shut people down and silence them with the traumas that we faced. I've, I've been in conferences where I've explained, you know, particular parts of, you know, being mentally distressed in prison or whatever, and they're quite graphic, they're quite sort of heart-wrenching things, and a silence feels, you don't get, you get people sort of saying thank you and stuff like that, people want to say something, but they don't say anything about how things change. And so it appears to me that maybe I'm sort of sharing all these stuff in, in this, not graphic or gratuitous detail, but in enough detail to make it real. And I don't know that it's always helpful to just sort of, you know, idolize or subordinate to just that one voice. In the same mm. way it wouldn't be to subordinate to data or 
subordinate to a particular policy. So rather than shut people down, silence them with the traumas I faced, I want this group to be part of us all meeting each other in commonality. So essentially the best outcome would be to acknowledge that different sets of language exist for the same issues cross-culturally. For example, prisoners speak about the same issues together that criminal criminology dis scholars discuss in conferences. And I know this because I've been in both. That's the usefulness of my lived experience. I have learned some of the language that the academics use um, to describe the same things I've talked about with my padmates on the London. Uh, and yet there's often a loss in translation during the research projects that aim to amplify this in service user focus groups and the official ombudsman channels. It's only by training in the field which studies us that I begin to see the disparity between what was being said and what the professionals were hearing. Uh, but to hear all we need to, we cannot expect a population with, what is it, 45% illiteracy, 60% with mental health issues, and the entire population removed from its home. Uh, you know, we're expecting them to come to this new place, learn a new language, and understand what their stories sound like in that new language. Uh, that's, that's a real tall order to ask of anyone. And I, I love the sound of my own voice. It took me a while to do it. Okay. Uh, let's take a, an analogy, a refugee. This is a sort of ridi ridiculous uh, concept to think that people turn up here because they really can't survive in their own country. And we have an expectation of them to learn how to be this sort of person, learn the language. Uh, you can't stay here if you don't speak the lingo. I mean, in prison, it's sort of the opposite. You, you can't get out unless you learn the psychobabble and uh, the Oasis glossary. If you don't do that, you're destined to remain stuck in the things that keep you offending. And probation might never know what you might need from them, but it won't stop you trying to find things right. through the club. 10 more seconds, Gareth, sorry. Seconds, okay. Yeah. I guess the thing I want to end with then is I would personally bring to the network um, is what I'd personally bring to the network. Uh, I would like us to try and pay attention to how the voice of lived experience engages with the current language that is used to drive CJS policy. As I vie for more demonstrable outcomes to come from hearing my pain and my story, which I think is a reasonable price, I also want it to not envelop or dominate the voices of other lived experiences. I want it to combine and enhance our understanding and not to replace it. For me, it is when one dominant voice or one perspective squeezes out the others that we have injustice. For me, it's when, uh, I've done that bit, uh, whether it's one particular institution, one criminological theory, one political ideology, or even if it's the people with eyewitness statements of the issues, we all come, as it's been said already, with our own biases and our own judgments and insecurities, and we should be able to speak about them and disagree with them and find a way of recognising all the voices that need to be heard. And that's the only way that my story or anyone else's uh, will be valuable to the conversation of criminal justice reform.